Hello, my name is Jack Abramoff, and thank you for having me on The Point. You know, I used to be a lobbyist in Washington, D.C. I used to work on K Street, and we used to all go up to Capitol Hill to get everything we wanted from our, for our clients. Many of our clients and many of the clients in Washington are the special interest, and some are the general interest. But the fact is, lobbyists have far too much ability to sway members' votes. And one of the reasons lobbyists have such a great ability to sway members' votes in Congress is because many of those congressmen want to eventually become lobbyists. Now, they may not call a lobbyist, they may call themselves strategic advisors or history professors if they're a certain fellow who's running for president, but the fact is the cashing in on their government service is something that Americans are getting sick of. And whether it's a congressman and senator, or whether it's a staffer, somebody who comes to serve the public needs to serve the public and then go home and get a real job, not come to Washington, stay in Washington, and earn millions of dollars. Americans are sick and tired of seeing people arrive here worth $10,000 and leave worth $10 million. Some of it, and this is perhaps an even sicker part, is done while they're in office. Others is, frankly, after they leave office, they're able to make a fortune. And I think Americans resent that because they're making a fortune off of the public service. So I believe, and I've written in my book, Capital Punishment, which has come out, that this needs to stop. We need to close that revolving door and we need to forever shutter it so that Americans once again have faith in their government and Americans don't view their Congress with a 9% approval rating. There are frankly few occupations in this country that have a 9% approval rating. Congress doesn't know why that is. We need to tell them why it is. And one of the reasons that it is is because they're cashing in. I hope they'll stop. Thank you very much. Uh, I didn't think that the day would come when I would say I totally agree with Jack Abramoff, uh, but I do, Anna. Uh -huh. And how much do you think the American public is aware of what he's talking about here? Well, if you asked me this a year ago, I would tell you not really aware at all. Uh, but as he had mentioned in that video, Congress has a 9% approval rating at this point, which is like a record low. And also think about all the Occupy movements. You know, if you watched independent media interviewing these Occupy protesters, a lot of them mentioned this very issue. So I think that more and more people are catching on to it. But I think the problem is the reason why the majority of Americans don't know about this issue is because the media is either clueless on it or they want to protect their corporate interests and not say anything about it. You know, my mind goes back to a month ago when he had an interview with Leslie Stahl. And during that 60 Minutes interview, he was telling her, yeah, I bought Congress. That's what I did. And I did it all the time. And Leslie Stahl was like, Really? <laughs> she was so amazed by that. And it's like, really, you are a journalist. You are a very respected reporter. You don't know that that's going on. I don't know if she was playing stupid or if, you know, they're really that clueless about well, it. Well, it brings to mind two things, right? Uh, one is, I remember when Rick Sanchez did a similar story, like back when he was still hired by CNN, mm -hmm. and he did a story about, hey, look at this, these senators that are voting on the health care bill are actually getting paid a ton of money by the health care lobby. And he was like, whoa, yeah. right? But at least he did the story. He's the only guy on CNN I've seen do a story on that. When that, I, Michael, I think that's the driving issue. So Leslie Stahl's like, what? You influence congressmen? And you know, Rick Sanchez is blown away, and, they, and no one else covered. And there are legitimate routes to lobbying. I mean, lobbying started, history says that it started in the Willard Hotel in Washington, D.C., is that in the 1800s, people used to go in, in there with their interests, and the congressmen and senators would come into the lobby, literally, and they would have their conversations about what they wanted to see done there. Uh, it got, obviously, perverted along the way. Something happened to the process that totally changed it. And, you know, J you don't agree with Jack Abramoff. Jack Abramoff now agrees with you. And there's a, there's a big difference there. Uh, he People have started to come around. It takes a whistleblower sometimes to see that change happen. But, you know, he doesn't come up with a cure for it. And there are lots of people who discuss what the cures would be for it. But, it, it, you know, you have to be able to have that First Amendment protection as well as not have it be sort of bastardized by, by the lobbying the way it is now, the system well, the way it Richard, is now. Richard, I have a theory as to when some of that change began that Michael's referring to. Uh, late 1970s, couple of uh, Supreme Court decisions, Buckley v. Vallejo, and then uh, uh, another one where they say not only does money equal speech, but corporations right. have the right to speech, right? And that's before Citizens United. Now, Citizens United said they can spend unlimited money on PACs, so that just put it on steroids. But at that point, 
look, we've always had rich people, but corporations have unlimited money that they could bring into the process. Didn't that really go a long way towards corrupting it? Oh, it's all about the money. That's that's really what it's all about. And absolutely. So, you know, I mean, even if you think about guys who aren't openly corrupt, like maybe there's a Democrat you kind of like, he goes to Washington, all of a sudden after two or four years, he's one of those types of corporate politicians. <clears throat> they spend their whole lives raising money from these people. And these lobbyists are the guys with the money. They're the guys they have to please. They're being programmed day in and day out to make these people happy. And when I worked for Wall Street companies, I dealt with some of the, you know, the lobbying divisions of the large corporations, and it was just mind-boggling what you'd see, just my, even my little glimpse of it, that they just have to chase money night and day. And, and you know what Richard says is true, uh, but just by, by changing campaign finance law, while the two are related, that's not going to change lobbying law. That's not going to change what happens. So say you change campaign finance law, say you overturn, you overturn Citizens United, you're still going to have the corruption of lobbying. You're still going to have people going to Capitol Hill forgetting how much they can give to a campaign or to a super PAC or anything like that. They're still going to be paying these people to try and be strategists, to try and go up to the hill and influence the votes. But that's exactly what Abramoff is talking about. Yeah. And actually, it uh, was part of my original proposal proposal for Wolfpack, you know, we've set up a, a super PAC to, f to try to get money out of politics. I dropped this because it's just too hard, we, and maybe we'll come back to it another day. But it was what he's talking about here, and, and it's, I would have put a 10-year lobbying ban on anyone who works in Congress or it, it, as a congressman, senator, president, or as a staffer, or as a general in the Pentagon. Right, because those guys go back and then get huge money from you know, the defense industry. When Obama went to Kansas with a site of Teddy Roosevelt's speech, I, if you've read Teddy Roosevelt's speech that he gave in Kansas, he said nobody who works in government, elected or unelected, should ever work directly or indirectly for corporations. That they should be two completely different career tracks. And I, so I agree with Michael in that sense. But just overthrowing Citizens United wouldn't be enough as long until we have publicly funded elections. It's it's going to be a broken system. Yeah, and you know, when it comes to the revolving door of politics, uh, Senator Bennett tried to, you know, pass this act that would ban co exactly what you mentioned right now, members of Congress from either retiring or serving their terms or getting elected out of office and then going to work for a corporation or a lobbying group. And what happened with that act? Absolutely nothing. Yeah, here's what happened. <laughs> Nada, okay, right. bupkis. Now, let me give you guys just some examples of, of the people who have done this to give you a sense of how bad it is. Uh, here are the guys who are now employees of Goldman Sachs or paid consultants for them after they left office. Uh, Arthur Levitt, uh, former chairman of the SEC, which is supposed to regulate these guys. Judd Gregg, former senator uh, from New Hampshire. Uh, Dick Gephardt, now Judd Gregg's a Republican. Dick Gephardt, of course, uh, a very powerful congressman for the Democrats. Uh, Richard Roberts, former SEC commissioner. Again, Greg Craig, who was one of the good guys in the Obama administration, now working for Goldman Sachs. So, I mean, are you not influenced by the fact that you might get paid a tremendous amount of money? And of course, the guy is, who's the best example, Billy Tawson. So he starts as a Democrat, but he doesn't give a damn. He eventually switches to Republicans when they're in power. They're doing the Medicare prescription bill. He writes the bill totally in favor of the drug companies, leaves uh, office, gets $2 million from them. And then he finally left, left as the head of the pharmaceutical company's lobby just uh, this past year. When he left, he got, I couldn't believe this number, $11.6 million dollars. Now, when you have that kind of financial incentive, Michael, of course you're going to think about that. Yeah, well, I mean, you also, I mean, there, there has, there's another side to the story. I mean, there's the, the people that would argue that there has to be some way for these public servants, and go with me for a second here, people who go to Washington to give up these big salaries, Billy Tozan may, maybe could have worked for Goldman Sachs many years previously, takes a, a federal uh, wage, and then he wants to come out into the real world and make some money. A lot of these people never made money in their lives until they leave Congress. There has to be a way of giving them a boundary as well, where, where people can go to Congress and then can can get a job. Just It doesn't have to be a job where you go lobby Congress. That's all. You just can't be it have anything to do with strategizing or lobbying. And that, that should be simple. They make, what is it now, $173,000 a year? 
That's not millions, but it's not nothing. No, it's not nothing, Richard. But it, it, there's a there's a certain level of money that, that a lot of people want to make, and a lot then of people that go into service. business. Well, why? But that's that's wrong. You know, of course, why? be a public service. Why can't you be both? Why can't you be a public servant? Because we've got a huge issue of systemic corruption here. What Jack Abramoff did that was illegal is not with that. nearly as bad as what I, he did that was legal, right? Yeah. So, Michael, I, I understand what your concern is, right? And sure, we can set up the right boundaries. So we can say, hey, you know what, you want to work at your law firm back in your home state that has nothing to do with Washington. Of course you can do that, right? Yeah. Uh, but I would rather err on the side of caution and say they can't do anything that relates back to Washington. Well, and then say, hey, you know what, that might screw a couple of honest guys that would have normally gotten a job, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, we got to fix the system. I'm not here, saying right? anything very differently. I'm just saying that you should not be allowed to lobby or be part of a strategic, any kind of a strategic enterprise when it comes to, to speaking to Congress or dealing with Washington. It should not restrict you from going to work for Goldman Sachs just by virtue of the fact that you served in Congress, though. Uh, you know, I would I would probably stretch that definition longer than you would, but I understand your point. The one last point on this, so the audience gets a clear sense of how why they do all this lobbying, why they buy all those politicians. The oil industry spent 110 million dollars lobbying last year. Now that's a lot of money, right? What do they get back in oil subsidies alone, let alone every other benefit that they get? At least 24 billion dollars a year. You put in 110 million, you get back 24 billion. That That's why you buy these politicians. And you're excluding the tax breaks they get as well when you when you talk about that.